everybody. Welcome to the Hallmarkies podcast. And today we are talking with one of our Hallmark authors today. We're talking with Caridad Pinero. And we're so excited to be here. And I am film critic Rachel Wagner and Bree's here. Hello, everybody. And Caridad, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Well, thank you so much for asking me. It's my pleasure to be here with you to talk about South Beach Love. Yay. Yes. Congratulations <laughs> on the new book. It's such a great accomplishment. And we like to start out by asking our guests what inspired you to become a writer. Um, well, believe it or not, it goes back to the fifth grade. Um, had a teacher who assigned a project. You had to write a 20-page book by the end of the year, and it was going to be put in a class lending library. I'd always been an avid reader. It had never occurred to me to take the stories in my head and put them on paper. But from the moment she gave that assignment, I went home and I started writing away in, in my journal. And well, I guess back then it was those black and white, uh, you know, uh, what do you composition call those? books. Yeah, uh, yeah that's it. Composition books. And, you know, my poor mom with about a month ago, uh, she had to help me type uh, my book. It was 120 pages <laughs> and it was a romance. And from that day on, I just knew someday I had to really write, a, a, you know, a, a big book. Um, and I was hooked on writing. That's Shout out great. to that teacher. Yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, early on. Yeah. That started. That's great. I, I did. And I kept it up through high school, college. I, I went to law school. I'm retired now, thankfully. Um, and I just kept it up all that time. And um, I just never stopped writing. Did you always have an interest in romance? You know, when I was young, I didn't really know what it was at first. Um, but yeah, every book I ever read, um, it had to be a romance. And I remember one summer, I took out Wuthering Heights from the library so much that the lady at one point told me, well, you can't take this book out anymore. <laughs> <laughs> and I don't think I was more than like 10 or 11 or something like that. Um, Who knew there so, were such limits on the library? Yeah. You, can only read, you can only get the book so many times. <laughs> I guess maybe it was the only copy they had. I don't know. You know, back then, you know, we really couldn't afford to buy books. My parents would buy us some kids books, but, yeah. um, you know, it was, you know, we always were in the library or waiting. I don't know if they still do this, waiting for the bookmobile in the summer. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah. I, I hope said, they still do it. That would make me sad if they don't do that anymore. <laughs> I know. Right? Yeah. Well, now you have little free libraries. You do. We have, we have them all over. I have to go and put books in some of them so people get uh, to experience some of my other things. Mm -hmm. That's true. I've, well, I've wanted to get one of those. But I don't know there's, if there's uh, that many kids in my neighborhood. I mean, there's some, I guess, but not that many. Not that it would only have to be for kids. But... but uh, I noticed on your website that you had written in a lot of different genres, uh, that you had paranormal on there and uh, women's fiction, and I don't know, there were a number of different categories that were listed. And so I was curious to ask about that. Um, I had always, um, I think when I, when I first started reading romances, the big thing was, you know, the historicals, you know, mm -hmm. the days of... Beatrice Small and, and all of those people. But when I started writing, I knew I was going to do contemporaries when I started off. Um, and I, the first line I wrote for was actually the, the nation's first Latino romance line. And mm -hmm. I had written about eight or nine books for them. And I just wanted to challenge myself. And I wanted to write something darker and grittier. And that's when I wrote my first um, paranormal romances and they were really kind of like vampire suspense books um, and I was writing for those for Harlequin at the time and they thought it was just kind of a natural segue for me to write suspense that didn't have um, the vampires and the paranormal elements so little by little I just found myself branching out um, and then after about a decade of writing these dark you know paranormals and sus suspense books I just felt like I needed to, to do something that was lighter and dealt with women's issues more than anything else. I found myself at a point where I, I just thought, you know, there's so many things we go through as women. You know, we get married, friendships change, we have children, friendships change. Um, and, you know, there were so many things and you have careers and that impacts 
your life in so many ways. And that's when I decided to go back and start writing contemporary books that were still romance, but dealt with those issues. Um, they were still the romance was the primary thing. And I, the first thing I did with those was my At the Shore series um, for source books, which begins with One Summer Night. Um, and there are two other books in the series. Um, and that also led to me writing this Hallmark book, uh, South Beach Love, um, which was just, you know, a fun contemporary romance. But still, underneath the romance, there are other elements and issues in the story. Um, and then I'm actually writing a more women's fiction book. I had done some for uh, Simon & Schuster, but I, I'll be doing another one in February for of 2022 for Source Books, which is really a story of my heart because... Um, it's about a family being reunited after being estranged, but a lot of the stories about the family really come from my family's real life history in, in leaving Cuba. Um, so I'm really excited about that one. And I think you get some of the Cuban culture actually in South Beach Love because it is set in Miami. And, you know, there's the story with, you know, the girls and their parties. And mm -hmm. also, you know, I think there's a lot of the culture in there uh, because of the hero um, and his family and also the heroine's family, the, you know, the sister-in-law. Um, so it was a lot of fun to kind of include that in the story. That, that would be, that would be fun. I mean, it's gotta be fun to at least try uh, these different genres and kind of different settings and not get kind of married to one uh, one, one spot. I know that I think a lot of authors kind of end up through one thing or another, just be kind of stuck on one, uh, one setting and you can't really get out of it very well. Yeah, no, you can't. I think the hard thing though, like if you're, you're first starting out, um, it was really funny when I was first starting out, I, you know, I had eight or nine books to, you know, my credit and when I went to write the dark stuff, they said, well, but can you write the dark stuff? And then they yeah. said, oh, yeah, you can. And then when I when I went to write the light stuff again, they said, well, can you write this light stuff? Every time I go to change, <laughs> they're like, well, you know, a writer's a writer. But it's, I guess it is true that you, don't, you can't necessarily do all things well. Um, so, but I think... I was lucky enough to be able to do that and, and to have readers who would follow me from something dark yeah. to something contemporary and, and so on. Um, but I think for beginner authors, you know, if you're just starting out, um, I, and my suggestion to an aspiring author is find so, one thing that you think you're really good at and stick to yeah. it for at least three or four books yeah. um, because, you know, it, it kind of establishes you before you start kind of venturing out yeah. into multiple genres. Yeah. yeah, you know you're a a pro prolific writer if you're like, oh, it was just my first eight or nine books. That was no big <laughs> deal. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I am prolific. <laughs> if nothing else. <laughs> so would you consider yourself a pantser or a plotter? Oh, that's a good one. Can I, can I say plant, sir? I, don't know. <laughs> um, I think I'm much more structured. I used to definitely be a pantser mm -hmm. um, where I just let the story take me wherever. But now I have a tendency to really sit down and at least write a couple of pages about where the story is going and what I want it to be about. Um, and actually for that family history story that I was talking about, I actually, because I did want to include real life stories, I had to do it in a way that would work with this overall um, story about a family that's estranged and, and, a, and a very strong romantic element. So I actually did actually do a chapter by chapter outline for that one. Um, uh, but that's not something that I typically do. I, I generally do just a very two or three page, here's the story <laughs> and, and, and take it from there. Yeah. Yeah, I think I probably would be somewhat like that. I mean, I like to make my outlines for the podcast, so I can imagine uh, it being you know similar if I was ever really going to sit down and write. Mm -hmm. uh, you want some kind of guidance. Uh, so I've done NaNoWriMo. That's the only only writing that I've ever really done. Uh, right. And that's totally about pantsing, but uh, I don't know. It's fun. 
Brie, have you ever actually tried to write? Oh my gosh, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I love their, the cool thing about reading romance is there tons of romance authors have written like romance writing craft books. And I uh-huh. love those, but I've never read them and like took notes in the sense of, Oh, I'm going to write my own book. I'm like, I'll leave these up to the pros. I just love reading them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah but so, I think that's the key to being a good writer is to read and read and read and read mm-hmm, and, and mm-hmm. see what people are doing and learn from it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I just need the time. I've thought of, I mean, like I said, I have done NaNoWriMo four times, but now I, I haven't done it in a long time because I'm just so busy in November these days covering Hallmark movies. But <laughs> yeah, yeah. by the time November comes, we've already had like three weeks at yeah, the most of, of Christmas movies. So I, I was thinking about it because they, they announced a couple of the Netflix movies coming Christmas Netflix movies. And I think in, it's only really two months before I'm already starting to think about covering Christmas and uh, pretty much by the middle of August, I've got an idea of like who I want to interview and (laughs) it's crazy. Yeah. Because, because they, I mean, they start the 22nd of October. So that means that all of the preview shows have to be done before then. So we have to preview Netflix, have to preview lifetime, have to preview two episodes one for each channel of of um, Hallmark, and uh, <laughs> uh, it's just intense. It's an intense yeah. time, but it's really yeah. fun. And uh, so, there's uh, no room for writing a book in November. <laughs> yeah, in November, <laughs> that's, that's, oh, that's right. Anyway, but how did you first uh, get in contact with Hallmark Publishing and and get started uh, writing this book, um, South Beach Love? Um, well, I, you know, I had been writing the, you know, the contemporary stories, you know, that, that at the shore series that I mentioned, and I just love the Hallmark movies. It was, they were just so much mm-hmm. fun. And I've always wanted to see something that I did made into a movie. And all of a sudden, you know, when I was kind of thinking about what am I going to write next? Um, because I was just finishing up a project. My agent reached out to me and she said, what do you think about Hallmark? And I said, well, I love their movies and stuff. And she said, well, you know, they're looking for things. Are you interested? And I'm like, oh, are you kidding? Am I interested? <laughs> I'm really, really interested. Um, and, you know, we sat down and, you know, we kind of brainstormed, um, an idea, you know, I I always wanted it set in Miami. I I did want to see something different on the channel. Um, They do such wonderful work. And I think they've done a a great job of increasing their diversity. And um, I thought, well, why not do it by just setting the story somewhere where there is a lot of of a different culture there. And so um, I know that family is very important. It's important to me. And I, as it was an important theme to have in the book, um, which is why we had the teens with their whole quince's drama and um, we pitched it and they were instantly like, wow, this is really something we'd be interested in. Yay. And, I love yeah, that. <laughs> yeah. And it went from one thing to the other. And the next thing I knew, you know, they, they bought the book and we had started working on the project. So I was very excited about that. Um, and, you know, I have submitted um, something else to them, a Christmassy kind of movie, which mm. hope, hopefully they'll buy. But I'm also looking forward to doing stories about some of the other characters in the book as, you know, as you read through it, I, I, you know, you'll, you'll see who are the other characters that I, you know, I want to. Yeah kind of showcase Mm -hmm. yeah there's a lot of potential in this world because you have two whole families and all the characters surrounding the families and so i think there's a lot of places you could go with a with spinoffs and and uh, sequels yeah, no, for sure. I, I think the first one I really would love to do is Jerry and Rick, um, because they are really, yes. um, you know, the, the next most, um, I guess the ones who get the most space on the pages. Um, Rick is su- just such a down home, good guy and um, so supportive of his sister um, and supportive of Tony. Like, 
you know, I don't know how anybody could not like Rick and Jerry on the other hand is really kind of like a spitfire. Some of the things she does in the book. Yeah. So surprise me actually. <laughs> um, but um, I would love to explore, you know, she's, she's got little Sophie, she's got her baby and um, a story about a man kind of walking into a family that's, you know, already a mom and a daughter. And um, so I really would love for that to be the next story in the series. And I've already started kind of working on that to pitch to them. So I'm hoping they'll be interested yeah. in it. Well, uh, that sounds good to me. Uh, yeah. I Did you have anybody in mind when you were writing for Tony and Sarah that you were thinking of? Oh, you mean, you like mean to, pl yeah, to, to play, play the roles? Um, no, not really. Um, I, it's funny. I'm, I'm a very visual writer, but I don't normally put pictures up of the characters mm -hmm. and the like. I don't know why, but I, I don't. I know a lot of people, they build collages and notebooks yeah. and everything. Yeah. And, I, and, I, and I don't. Pinterest boards. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, and then what happens is people ask me, well, who would you think would be the perfect person? Yeah. And after after looking around and stuff, um, Michael Trevino came to mind. I thought he would be like the perfect age and everything. I think he's from, what is it, The Vampire Diaries? Uh-huh. Um, and then my daughter jumped in with, oh, the, the Spy Kids girl, you know, and her <laughs> oh, husband. Alexa. Yeah, they would be perfect. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> If you say so, you know, she's obviously uh -huh. much more keen on what's happening. I didn't even realize the spy. I mean, I knew the spy kids girl had grown up, but apparently she's in a lot of the, um, I've seen her now in a lot of the Hallmark movies. Yeah. Um, so, you know, but I, yeah, I'm not one of those authors that really says, oh, this is the perfect person. Um, well, the whole time, like we had said off air that I kept thinking of Beauty and the Baker. And so Vanessa and Mateo. I, I don't know those actresses, actor and actresses names, but I could totally picture them being Tony and Sarah. Oh yeah. No, yeah. totally. I so love, good. I love those characters yeah. from, from that show and I could totally see them. I mean, Vanessa is, um, is gorgeous. I actually, yeah. if I had to cast her, I would cast her more as Jerry, um, uh -huh. which is funny. Um, but, um, yeah, they would totally be um, yeah. fabulous for this, and and hopefully maybe one day we will and we will see a movie of yeah. this. That would be um, so fun. hope so, right? <laughs> Ma yeah, Mateo is David Del Rio is the name, uh, but uh, yeah, they were really good. What about what did you think, uh, uh, Bree? When you were reading, uh, did you have someone you pictured for uh, Tony and Sarah? Not really. I think that what I liked about it was sometimes like there's constant emphasis on like what they look like or what their hair color looks like. And, you know, it, like it's good to paint that picture. But what I loved is you kind of left it up for us to figure out who we mm -hmm. want them to be. Yeah. And I think that made like that was just an equally just as much fun as like getting all the descriptions and being able to picture them in your head. So I really love that you touched on that. You, you know, while you are a visual person, you don't surround yourself with all of these like inspirations. Cause yeah. as a reader, it felt like, okay, I can make them whoever I want them to be. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny you say that because I actually do that on purpose for, for just that reason. I give mm -hmm. you a very basic description of what they look like. Um, but I want you to then fill in the blanks yourself. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the reasons is when you do that, I think you become much more engaged in the story thinking about like, yeah. what does they look like? And, and they become almost personalized to you. Um, mm -hmm. and so I have a tendency not to overwork what they look like and things like that, because I'm much more involved with what's their character like. You know, um, what kind of person are they? Um, what are the things that are important to them? Um, so I like to stress those elements rather than so much the physical elements. Um, yeah. We'd like to take a second and thank our sponsor for this episode of the podcast. From the author of Miracles and Menorahs comes a story about history, responsibility for it, and how true love can change the future. History of Us is the second book in Stacey Agdern's Friendship and Festivals series. Available on June 24th from Thule Publishing and wherever books are sold. For more information about Stacy, visit her website at www.stacyagdern.com. That's stacyagdern.com. Well, why don't you tell people 
uh, why don't you tell our listeners who may not have, have read the book, like we have, why don't you tell them a little bit about what the book's about? Southbeach. Sure. Um, well, South Beach Love, the, the hero in the story is, is Tony Sanchez, and he is kind of like a celebrity chef. He's reached the top of his career, um, and he's just been very busy and finding that he's not necessarily in a happy place. Um, and he gets um, a, an invitation for his niece's quinceanera. Um, for people who don't know what that is, it's kind of like a sweet 16, but like totally blown out. It's a very important tradition in Latino culture. Yes. Almost like my a wedding. My cousin is prepping for her. She's 14. So I think yeah. maybe her family, is it 15 or is it 16? It's 15. Okay. So she, yeah, she's 14. So I'm like, why are you doing it now? Why are you buying dresses? It's a big deal. <laughs> it is a big deal. It's almost like a wedding. I yeah. mean, the girl has a, has a, not only has females like in a bridal bride party, but each of those girls has a companion to walk in with, like a you know, like the ushers. Um, you get a fancy gown. You've got to have a tiara. Um, there's a whole process that happens during the party, a whole tradition and ritual, um, and so it's a really big deal. Um, so Tony has no choice but to go to Miami for this, even though he hasn't been there in several years. Um, but on top of that. His sister really wants, like I said, to blow it out. So she's asking him to do all the, the cooking and, and design the menu and everything for this very fancy party. Um, and underneath that, so now Sarah is a really up and coming chef. She has her own fabulous restaurant with her partner, Jerry, in Miami. Um, Sarah is an Irish American, um, but her older brother is married to a Cuban. And their daughter is turning 15. She's actually a big rival of Tony's niece. Um, they're always competing for everything in school, you know, school president, had to, you know, soccer captain, the whole business. Um, and Sarah gets asked to do her wedding, you know, her wedding, her quinceanera. And she says yes, because she wants to help out. Um, and unbeknownst to them, this is happening in the background. And so when Tony comes back um, to Miami, he runs into Sarah's brother, um, the, the one who's not married, Rick. And he says, hey, man, you know, you're a great chef, but you haven't been around. And check it out. You know, little Sarah has become, you know, a chef and she's doing really well. And so Tony goes to check out how well Sarah is doing and realizes, whoa, Sarah's grown up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a fun thing, too, because obviously, you know, he's your best friend and she's, the, you know, the sister. And she's grown up from being a tomboy who's who's chased after them to a beautiful um, young woman um, who's very intriguing on many levels. Um, and as they start falling in love, um, the unthinkable happens. These quince parties that were just supposed to be, were catering them, they didn't even realize that they were doing it. And what happens is that a magazine is doing an article about the revival of quinceañeras in Miami, and they decide to really up the game and turn it into a competition as to who is going to have the best quinceañera and the best food at the quinceañera. And they start doing, you know, like a Twitter war and the trolls come out to pick on Tony because he left Miami and I'm rooting for Sarah. And it just gets totally out of control. Um, and unfortunately they find themselves in the middle of this battle. Yeah. Um, and it just goes from there. And obviously, you know, that impacts on their relationship. Um, you know, in a negative way, but I just loved how everybody around them comes in to support them. Uh, and, and how at the end of the day, as everything happens, the family comes together, both the teens and the sister-in-laws and the brothers, um, to really kind of show what's important about what's happening both in the Quinces and with this competition. And that was just a fun storyline to kind of write out for everybody. And um, yeah, and I hope people will enjoy it and I hope they'll enjoy seeing all the different 
foods and things that uh, Sarah and Tony are both preparing for these parties, but also the family aspects that are there. Um, I think some of my favorite scenes are when Sarah is being taught how to cook this food by her, by her Cuban sister-in-law and how they're sharing recipes and sharing stories. And she's really getting to know so much more mm -hmm. about that side of her family. Um, so those were some of my, I think, most emotional scenes in there. Um, and I love how the girls' rivalry kind of, you know, ends up. Um, and obviously how the romance ends up as a result of all of these interlaced um, things in, in, in the book. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think food is like, it's, you really emphasized in this book how much food is a love language. Mm -hmm. um, those, the, the cooking scenes and then getting to know your family through food. It just, it really hit on that. And I, I love seeing that. Yeah. Well, I find in my own, you know, my own personal life, um, you know, I remember uh, this one celebrity chef, cause I'm like, that's one of my guilty pleasures. If you can't tell from the food in the book, yeah. um, he said that you don't really lose your culture until the day you lose your food. Mm -hmm. And I think that's so true because it's not just about you're eating it. Like I remember my mom and grandma teaching me how to make something and they would tell me about how their mom, you know, like my grandma told me about her mom and how she taught me how she did it and how, you know, this story about one time we were going here, you know what I'm saying? And I think in particular, especially with women, we're the storytellers, we're the ones who carry on their traditions. And I think one of the ways we do it is through recipes. Yeah. Um, and as I, and I, unfortunately I lost my mother at a very young age. So when I'm telling my daughter, this is how you make this, but I'm also telling her, Hey, my mommy used to do this and she used to do that. And boy, was she so smart because this and that. So it keeps the memories alive. It keeps the people alive and connected with that. It keeps your culture alive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I was going to ask if you consider yourself a foodie. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. I'm a foodie. I love to cook. I love to eat. Uh, yeah, totally. Well, and one thing too, like, you know, it's this big, um, like Cuban community in Miami. Right. And it's almost like it, for me, it read like them, holding on to that piece of themselves because yeah. when you come to the states it's so easy to just become very americanized and lose like that part of your culture you know um and so i loved seeing that connection and then with sarah seeing her learn about her family through that through the food like it really felt like um that way that they were trying to hold on to this really big part of who they are. Yeah, no, totally. Like we, when we came to the U S um, we went to New York and we didn't go to any kind of ethnic enclave like Miami or anything. And I, you know, grew up in the long Island suburbs and little by little, you know, I started losing that culture. Once I left the doors of my house, I mean, people call me charity, but, Caridad actually means charity. Uh -huh. And somebody asked my mom once, well, what, what does that mean? And then the next thing I knew, that's what people were calling me. And so, you know, I think that was the first step. My name got anglicized outside of the doors of my house. Um, I teasingly say that when I went to college, I went to Vanilla Nova, um, which I don't know if you're familiar <laughs> with Villanova, but very Anglo, very, you know, white bread. Um, and, and I married an Italian man. And, and so every little bit as my life moved along, I found myself growing more and more distant from my culture. Um, and then one time, this is, I, this is, was a turning point in my life. We were, have you ever seen the movie, the joy luck club mm -hmm. at the end of the joy luck club? I'm sitting there. My husband agreed to watch it. I don't even think he would, but at the end of the joy luck club, I am sitting there literally bawling. Yeah. I mean, bawling, like with stuff coming out of my nose and everything bawling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And I thought, oh my God, what will I leave of myself to my daughter? Yeah. I have like gotten so far away because my mom died, grandmother died, you know, everybody who could have given me that connection to my culture had left. And, um, and I wasn't again in an ethnic enclave. Um, so one of the things I started doing was speaking Spanish more again, when I could, um, I started reading more books about human history. Um, we made a point now of going every year down to Miami, um, and taking my daughter to little, little Havana and Cayocho and, and trying to immerse her in those things because, Um, it was easier to do it there than it was we were living. And, you know, every Sunday we'd go to Brooklyn for an Italian dinner, but I didn't have that. I, I, you know, I had no way of replicating that anymore for her with my Cuban side. Um, So, yeah, so it was, it was tough, but one of the ways we did it was through the food. Yeah. Um, Did you have a quinceanera? Growing up? I did, I did not, unfortunately. Um, again, you know, number one, because we were acclimating and becoming American. And, and the other was we just couldn't afford to do something like that, mm-hmm. um, you know, with having not been around in the States for so long and, you know, right. trying to move up the economic ladder. It wasn't feasible. Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, one thing I thought you did such a great job of in the novel was like creating a sense of touch, like a palpable, like the when he would touch her hair or uh, or her hands, and it was just and there was like an, a sensation through their bodies. Like I thought you did such a good job of really for something that's a squeaky, you know, that is a hallmark clean, you know, spice freeze. We like to call it on our show. <laughs> Uh, there was spice though, even though there wasn't spice. (laughs) Yeah. That, let me tell you, that was really one of the hardest things for me because if you looked at my website, you know that I, I do write some spicy things. Um, but, um, you know, it's really funny because sometimes, um, the most sensuous thing isn't necessarily, the sexiest thing. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, um, there are things, you know, the, the, you know, a very simple touch can communicate so much more than something that is, um, more erotic or whatever. Um, so it was a challenge to convey that in the book without getting into the spice zone. Um, (laughs) (laughs) yeah, Yeah, you succeeded. (laughs) I thought that was very well done and it just like drew you to what's going to happen. Come on. Come on, keep going. Yeah, the, <laughs> the buildup, the tension. Yeah, I think it makes things just so romantic. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love me some steam, but I love if it's not a steamy book, but the authors like I feel like sometimes we e- either we as readers just read so many romances that like we're not realizing it until you read a book like this where it's like, wow, she really put the romantic gestures into the romance novel. And that's like, I think touch also. I mean, I've done like lo- the five love languages test. Like I know physical touch for some people is a love language. And I was like, this is it. Like it's, yeah. it was so romantic. Well, thank you. Yeah. yeah and it, it was tough. It, you're right. And I do think that sometimes um, when you do, like sometimes when I, I would write steamy, it's so hard because even if it's steamy, I want the romance. I don't want it to just be about, um, just the steam, the (laughs) steam, right. I I mean, I want it to be about the relationship, about what they're feeling up in their brains. Um, and, and, and the like, because I think that's so much more important. And I was very grateful to write a book like this because, I had the time to think about the romance and all of these other things and, and, you know, how romantic that simple touch is or that smell is, um, all of these other elements, um, that really just let you build that intimacy, but not necessarily the kind of physical intimacy that we really, you know, don't have it, in what we call sweet romance. Yeah, it just makes it simmer. It's just like simmering and simmering and simmering until it's just like boiling over. It's so fun. 
It, it was so much fun. It really yeah. was. And I couldn't wait till the end. I said, okay, they can kiss at the end. Yeah, they can finally kiss. It was such an anticipation, even for me as an author. It was like, oh, yeah. finally. <laughs> That's how I felt. I, but it really helped them build their chemistry as a couple. And you're just like, what is he worried about New York City? Everything will be fine. He has to do whatever it takes to be with her. Really? No, totally. You know, it's like, I wanted to smack him. You're not going back to New York. Who wants to yeah. live in New York? It's cold. It's wet. Who cares? It's cold and it's wet. Well, you see yeah. here, like, you just, you told us that you moved to New York. I'm always, I have a thing about, especially with Hallmark, New York City is always the bad guy in the movie. It's like the yeah. extra bad guy. And I was like, but in this book, <laughs> it's not big city, big New York City versus small town because it's Miami. And I loved that. <laughs> it's like, it's not yeah. like our typical, you know, big city versus small town. And I, I, lo- I mean, I'm yeah. sure like I live in a big city, even big cities can feel like small towns because you stay in your part of the city. Um, but I just loved being in a different city that is like so culturally different from where I am. And I'm assuming has some very, you know, differences from New York. I've never been, my husband's from Brooklyn and he's never taken me and refuses because he feels like I'll act like a tourist. (laughs) So yeah. Oh my God. You need to go. How have you not? I'm so excited. I'm going to New York City in October. I cannot wait. (laughs) Oh, yay. (laughs) Because I just want to support Broadway so bad after what they've been through. So I cannot wait to go. Uh, You'll have to to let me go so we can maybe get together. Oh, that would be fun. That would be fun. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I know, so this is basically like a second chance kind of romance type story. And I feel like that trope is very popular. Uh, It seems like, I don't know if you feel that way, Brie, but it seems like like eight out of the 10 last romance novels I read have been second chance romance. And so I'm just curious why you think that is, that is a trope that works so well. I think that all, I think that everybody in their life, and maybe I am very wrong about this, has had someone that they don't end up with that the they what wonder, if. what if? Yeah. What yeah. if I had chosen that person instead of this person? Or even a job. I mean, think about it. Our whole life is filled with what ifs, which is bad because you shouldn't always be thinking about what if because that makes me wonder if you're very unhappy. But, but when there are comes- those paths that we don't take. I think you're absolutely right. right. Um, and so especially when it comes to romance um, and especially like, and I, and I, you know what? And I didn't really see this one as a second chance, but like with Rick and Jerry or like the next one, hopefully is Bridget and Jaime, um, you know, they obviously have had a relationship and it didn't work out either with them or with somebody else. And now it's like, well, who who will it work out with? Um, So I just think it's because it's kind of like a universal theme that everybody identifies with um, because at some point in their life, they took that different journey Mm -hmm. um, and they wonder what might've happened if I did, you know, the other one. I guess this is more not, not, maybe not second chance romance, more the siblings, best friend. Yeah. Your fr- your Which is my favorite sibling. trope. <laughs> <laughs> you oh, didn't too. even realize it that they were an option, and then all of a sudden, whoa, they are an option. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, true. I I love that because you know he saw her as a tomboy, and then all of a sudden there she is, um, and she's grown up and she's successful and she's yeah. his equal in every way, and that's the other yeah. thing for me that's very important in every story that I write. They're equal partners. Um, and if one is weak, the other helps them up, but they always, you know, end up on an equal plane. Um, I, 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 I hate to say it, but I hate these stories and, and it took off for a very long time. I won't say the name, you know, uh-huh. where the guy's the dominant and the girl is giving in. I, I'm just not, I'm too much of a feminist for that. <laughs> um, you know, even if it's role play or whatever. Would these happen to have vampires in <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, oh. do they have vampires? I don't think oh, I so. thought you were talking about Twilight. <laughs> oh God, no, no, no. But that spawned you know what that spawned. Yeah. Um I feel like this one, the title of it ends with a 
it it ends with a color and starts with a number. <laughs> it could be. Uh, it could be. Um, uh, but, okay, okay. Well, that's basically yeah. Twilight. Yeah. Probably fan fiction. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah that is. But, yeah, you know, right. Yeah, for me, I, I think people like to see that at the end of the story, you know, they're together and they're going to build this life together and they are going to be... Um, equal in, in yeah. the decisions they make and everything else. Um, because I think that's what you want. You want a partner in life who's going to be there for you when you need them and you're going to be there for them. And, and that's how you build the future together. And yeah. so um, that was a very important thing for me that, that Sarah, even though she doesn't have the notoriety that he has, um, and that's one of the other things I brought out in the book that, you know, female chefs, and you look all around, right? We know all the male celebrity chefs, right? Mm -hmm. But how mm -hmm. many female ones do we know? Um, and that's a yeah. huge problem in the restaurant industry. Females oftentimes can't get what they need to achieve that kind of, of status for a variety mm -hmm. of reasons. And I kind of mentioned that in the book, um, so for me, Sarah was like, okay, you go girl. Yeah, no, it's true. Like, you look at them and you feel confident that they are going to be a great couple. Yeah. There's not any doubt. And so, yeah, I really enjoyed the book. I thought it was very swoon worthy. Uh, and did you, have you spent a lot of time in South beach to be able to write about it? Um, when, when my daughter was younger, we went, we went there fairly regularly, um, almost every, every year for quite a number of years. Um, I've been there off and on since I think one of the problems that we had at one time was the only time we could go down was during spring break. And the spring break situation is really crazy there now. Um, once mm -hmm. everybody discovered it, um, I used to go down a lot when I was a kid, we had family and friends. Um, in Miami. And so almost every summer we would go spend at least a week or more um, with family and friends. So I'm, you know, I'm really familiar with Little Havana and South mm -hmm. Beach and, you know, downtown My uh, Miami and, uh, you know, the Bayshore area, the Bay Bay Bayside Marketplace, I think it's called. Um, so, and I'm actually hoping to get down there again this year because it's been a while, but um, yeah, I just love it. It's a really, really fun area. Yeah. I, I've been to Tampa. That's the closest I've been. Uh, so not, not quite there, but I did love, I love well, Florida at least. Yeah. Well, Tampa has a huge Cuban section yeah. too. E Ybor city is, um, um, I think is, is, has a lot yeah. of, of Cuban things. They, they used to have a, a thriving cigar making area right there mm -hmm. too, you know? Um, so fun. Yeah. I just love the beach. I could just be at the beach all day. <laughs> I just want to go and eat. Okay. That's what I want to do. <laughs> well, Brie, if you come to Brooklyn, I will make Cuban for food for you. Okay. Oh, Tell your gosh. husband. Get it together. To well, so my husband, he's from, his family's from Puerto Rico and his, mm -hmm. they all lived in, they moved in, lived in Brooklyn, but his mom moved to Alabama years ago and his, she's recently had her parents move there. So really the family that's in, Brooklyn is dwindling, okay. um, but I'm still like, I, I, I just want my son. I want my son to be able to see where his dad grew up yeah. and I want him, you know, we, they were, they tried to go to Puerto Rico every summer, but then COVID happened. So that doesn't happen. But you know, that one of the things we touched on earlier is I have that fear of like, is, are, is that big part of y'all's family, the culture, is it going to die out with my son? Like he doesn't speak Spanish, you know, I don't know how to cook Puerto Rican food, but we're so far away from his family. So yeah, it's, I'm like sitting here thinking like, well, what, I got to do better. Cause I don't want, you know, that big part of him to die, like to die out with him. So yeah, no, it's <laughs> tough. I, I tried and tried and tried to get my daughter to, to speak Spanish, but when, you know, your husband can't speak it and you know, what do you do? You don't, you know, I know some people manage to do it. I didn't. And then my daughter turned around and taught herself Korean. And I'm like, <laughs> Excuse me? You right. did what? You you know Korean. <laughs> but, but but what about the Spanish? And she just, you know, hangs her head in shame. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. 
Next book about Korean taco. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah. Mogo. Yeah. She's teaching she's teaching me uh, Korean. Uh, she actually has, <laughs> she has a, a great website called Korean from Context where she has a romance where she teaches you how to speak and read Korean. Oh, uh, I love that. You know? Well, that, so, yeah, because there's all the K, K dramas. Tons, tons of yeah. K dramas, and she, you know, she does K pop reviews and things like that. And <laughs> that um, is so cool. <laughs> so, one of the things we're hoping to do is, is to go visit Korea one of these days. And, mm-hmm. and to be honest, really, when you think about the K dramas, you could totally see like a Hallmark movie like that. Oh, yeah. 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 We did a special episode last September with my friends from the K pop converters, uh, it was all covering K drama. It was really fun, and we're definitely going to try to do one uh, again. It's just they're so long. They are very labor-intensive oh, to watch. <laughs> very much so. She <laughs> she convinced me to want to watch one called Reply 88. Um, and this is while she was living with us. Um, uh-huh. And so every, like, Friday night, we would sit there. We actually videotaped some of us with the masks, you know, the Korean <laughs> face masks and we're watching and having one you know and um I think it was like 22 episodes and they were long episodes you know they weren't like an hour um but they were so it was so much fun because we would be laughing and bawling and just they were just a lot of fun so fun well congratulations on the book I really enjoyed it it might be my favorite of these Hallmark publishing books oh thank you so much yeah, I really, really liked it. So I mean, we heard right that like they're making some changes in the publishing world, Hallmark Publishing, and I'm like, if this is one of the, yeah, if this is the direction that we're going, I'm excited. So mm-hmm. yeah, it's definitely my favorite since um, the Christmas Company, Elise Murray's book. That's that was always my favorite, but this one was very dishy. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. The, well, thank you so the much. Family, South Beach, everything. It's the perfect <laughs> yeah. summer read. Well, yeah. thank you. And I'd like to think too that, you know, you're seeing it and you see that there's a different culture and everything, but that you also see, oh man, there's so much like me. Like, I think if yeah. we, if we see that, even though we're different, we're so alike as well. Yeah. I yeah. think that just helps bring us together. You know what I'm saying? It helps us yeah. understand each other better. Absolutely. Um, so I'm hoping it does that, yeah. you know, also. And but I'm- I think with Tony and Sarah, the great thing is sometimes you just know. Like, that just that from the moment that they connected again they just knew that that That's was it person. and like yeah. they're gonna have to change their plans and <laughs> exactly yeah so... we're doing this we just have to figure out how period. right That's exactly <laughs> <laughs> so we'll have links affiliate links in the description if people want to pick up the book and uh, it's available all over the place and uh do you have social media you'd like to share um, well, I'm on, on Instagram at Caridad Panero. Um, also my Facebook fan page is I think Caridad Panero author. Um, and Great. I, I finally got hauled into the world of TikTok. Um, oh, which gosh. is, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Caridad Panero author. Um, so yeah, I I'm all over there. You. you posted, like you reposted a TikTok onto your Instagram and I was like, what is this? <laughs> I was like, let me go follow her now. <laughs> well, thank you. Yeah. No, you know, we had, um, it was really funny. I got together with my daughter and, and two of her close friends. We were sharing social media ideas. And it was so great because, you know, with conferences, not being able to do conferences. So four of us sat around literally all day. Oh, did you do this? We do that. And they thought, you've got to get on TikTok. So I'm like, okay. So it was lots of fun because we did do one. And I normally do um, video trailers for the for the books. But we just had a blast and we did some. So now I'm, real, I'm really enjoying that. I mean, I love technology and it's always fun to try new things you know yeah definitely well check that out we'll have all that information in the description and brie where can people find you i'm on instagram at falling for romance and i co-host the categorically romance podcast with my friend sarah where we chat about category romance and we have episodes wednesdays and saturdays so all of my information that you need you can find in my link tree on fall on falling for romance on instagram Perfect. And then you can find me at Rachel's Reviews, all of our social media, iTunes, YouTube, and on Rotten Tomatoes. Check that out. Also, we're both on Goodreads. Take a look at that. 
And uh, and then make sure you're following the podcast, the Home Rookies Pod and Home Rookies Podcast, all of our social media. And if you are listening on iTunes, please leave us your ratings and reviews. We appreciate that so much. And if you're listening on YouTube, please give this video a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. We appreciate that so much. We have our Patreon and merch uh, merch store. Check that out. That's all in the description. And thank you so much, Care Dad. This was a yes, great thank discussion. You. It was really fun. <laughs> well, thank you so much. I, I really had a delightful time chatting with you about one of my favorite topics, romance novels. Yes. What could be better? Yes. yes. <laughs> okay, we'll talk to you later. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.